Broadcasting from Salisbury University campus, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7, putting Delmarva first. Stay tuned for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. Globalization of trade has run into the buzz saws of nationalist reaction and the coronavirus. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. There is no doubt that the recent period of globalization has produced tremendous economic growth, but its economic displacement has also produced political movements, the most recent being Trumpism with its tariffs. Meanwhile, a new threat has arisen with the coronavirus pandemic, which promises to dampen economic growth and trade. Edward Goldberg, who teaches at New York University's Center for Global Affairs has written a new book entitled Why Globalization Works for America, and we have him on the phone this morning. Welcome to the program. Great. Good morning, and thanks for having me on. So I want to turn, by the way, to the first the pandemic, because it seems to me that it symbolizes uh, the impact that globalization has taken uh, place in terms of how people relate, the fact that people can't uh, necessarily go out and visit Europe anymore. What has, first of all, been the impact, and what does that mean in terms of globalization, the fact that this this has such an impact? Well, one, of course, it, it, it's, it's kind of personally frustrating that as Americans, we can't travel anywhere in the world. We used to have, you know, our passport used to be gold, and now nobody wants us. So that's, uh, to say the least, a little bit frustrating. Um, but, you know, I, I, I really believe the virus, like the... Um, the pandemic, what I call the pandemic of global warming to come, is a definition of why globalization is important. You can't build walls around the virus, just like you can't build walls around um, um, global warming. Basically, you know, you need an international effort to stop this. And, and of course, that's missing. Well, in terms of globalization, um it seems to me that it's a, it's a force to be reckoned with no matter how many tariffs are put up, no matter what countries do, things either get uh, outsourced to other countries or they get automated. Well, you, you know, you look at what happened here in the United States. First of all, job loss in the United States because of globalization has not really been a problem in the last 10 years. It's been automation, um, as you just said. Take, you know, in 1970, it took 10 people to make a ton of steel. Today it takes one. This is why the president's tariff from steel had no logic to them. Um, or look at um, outsourcing. So we, you can buy a pair of jeans at, for fifty, sixty dollars in Gap today, approximately. If they were made in the states, they would cost in the three hundred and forty dollar area. You know that differential is tremendous money into the average person's um, pocketbook. It's it's an indirect stimulus into the economy that makes the economy even grow more. So, what do you say to people who they look uh, at China, for instance, uh, who obviously has a growing economy and uh, they see jobs either being going over there or certainly has become? I think uh, well, somebody described it as sort of the factory of the world. What is their prognosis and how do they fit into this globalization? Well, for sure, China, China's economy has grown greatly. I mean, since um, they, um, since Deng Xiaoping's time, since they became semi-capitalist, in fact, which was a goal of the United States at that time. And for sure, they've taken a lot of manual labor jobs from the United States. Basically, this has ended, as I said, in the last ten years or so. But. Um, the reality is I, you know, I kind of look at it differently. I see the U.S., we are the leaders in human capital, in knowledge industries. And there's a very famous economist called um, David Ricardo from the 19th century. And he said a country should produce what it can ex in the export, what it can make the most efficiently. And we are the leaders in human capital products, whether that's Google, yet, hello, Go ahead. Or whether that's Google, whether that's um, um, Apple, any of these products, this is what we should be doing. This is how we should be making our money, not making jeans. I want to turn to, to Russia for a moment because uh, it, it seemed as if there was a moment uh, after the wall fell that uh, perhaps there might be something 
uh, economically that might revive Russia, and yet it seems to have fallen into simply being a, a supplier of uh, raw resources. This is Russia. One, one of my, <laughs> one of the, I honestly say, I used to be very involved in, in, in Russia, both in, in, in mainly in academically, but, um, you know, Russia is a sad um, thing for me. I have a sadness to it, because I really thought it could be a capitalist democratic country. Instead, it's turned into what my friend Tom Freeman calls a kleptocracy. Um, and only a home for natural resources. And in fact, you know, Russia is the country that chose not to be, play the globalized game. It had nothing to offer. It didn't invest in the future. It didn't invest in new factories. And look at China. In defense of China, China let other let companies come in, let them manufacture their abate with joint venture partnerships, but they learned from them and they became a part of the world economy. Some people will say now too much of the world economy. Russia never played that game. The game was um, oil. When oil was high, we are kings and we don't need to play the globalization game. And did you point out to, to, that China, it, the way its system is set up, that government it tends to support old industries, uh, prop them up? Yes, um, very much so. You know, China has a, a major political problem. People can't vent. You can't have unemployment in China. So what does the government do? There is old state-owned steel mills and factories such as that, and the government has to keep them in business. Totally, once again, I mentioned David Ricardo before, totally economically inefficient. So I want to turn to the United States because one of the things that uh, has struck me is that um, there is a political reaction to globalization, whether it's the technological end of it or even just the trade end of it. And you fault particularly those people who pushed a lot of the free trade, and particularly the Republican Party, as simply having forgot about how to deal with the displacement that occurs even as you uh, continue to grow economically. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the, you know, globalization isn't the problem. Globalization is as old as humankind. I mean, Yuval Noah Harari, the famous Israeli historian, had said, you know, cultures began swallowing and absorbing other cultures from the earliest times of history. Um, globalization is part of human's DNA. It's, and one could almost say it's the, it's the economic, political, culture economic, political, and cultural version of evolution. That being said, here in the United States, when globalization really, what we're talking about in globalization, when we're talking about low-cost jobs, manufacturing jobs, left the United States, and for whatever reason, the political system didn't respond. And this is very interesting, you know, historically. In the middle of the industrial, of our industrial revolution, after the, the Civil War, Teddy Roosevelt looked at, at what was happening and saw tremendous problems with monopolization. You started to have all the antitrust acts. He looked at how industries were polluting. You started to have all those environmental pieces of legislation. The Great Depression comes after all there's a safety net for industrial workers. For whatever reason, when globalization really hit, when, when low, when not low cost, when manufacturing jobs started to be exported to Asia and other places, for whatever reason, our political system didn't do anything. So globalization needs to be managed, and we failed that management. One of the things I know about is the fact that the, I think it was the early 70s, uh, the business community in particular made some decisions about trying to influence uh, government to deregulate uh, for deregulation. Uh, there were think tanks created. There were uh, other um, organizations put forward. And, as, and over a period of time, of course, you also saw the decline of, for instance, the number of union jobs. That all seemed to be um, almost purposeful in the sense that the business went ahead and did what it was, what it wanted to, what benefited itself. But in the end, it produced this sort of backlash um, in terms of displacement, and then obviously it becomes political. Oh, it was so extremely short-sighted that it is amazing. And you look at things, look, you look at 
part of globalization is down south now in the United States is full of autom- um, automobile assembly plants, mainly part of globalization, mainly foreign brands, BMW, Honda, um, Volkswagen, etc., etc. You have Alabama, no longer, you know, when I was growing up, it was the con plantations state. Now it's one of the largest exporters of auto parts in the world. All this is because of globalization. But it's interesting what happened there. So these plants came into the southern United States, but they never had to follow the same labor regulations. They never had to be, they were not unionized like the plants in Detroit. Something happened there. So what, in terms of this particular uh, populism we seem to be seeing, uh, the latest I indicate was Trumpism, um, it, it, the resentments to the dislocation um, of those uh, workers didn't really adhere to the opposition to free trade that we see now with with uh, with Donald Trump. It seemed to be subsumed with, uh, say, cultural issues, so that those people, particularly in the Republican Party, and not to bash the Republican Party, but those in the Republican Party who push for free trade, um, seem to still hold on to those voters. Well, I think, you know, it's... Um it's an old pact made, um, you know, by basically um, after the Civil War that the, um, and I think the theme constantly plays out itself in American history, where the wealthy Southerners realized they could um, can make a deal, a political deal, in, you know, for votes and get the um, poor redneck voters on cultural issues. And... For the wealthy Southerners, it didn't make a difference to them, cultural issues. They wanted their business interests, but they made a devil's alliance. And this alliance continued to Nixon's time. Nixon reemphasized it. And it's, um, look at Trump's administration. You know, Trump is so, you know, he, his base voters, I think, have no idea what he's doing and how it will harm them in terms of deregulation and all these really really laissez-faire types of, of, of proposals that he pushes through. They're really against the interest of the, his base, but he p- plays off the base by on social value issues. So I want to turn to this idea of uh, the both Bushes, um, because you are sharply criticizing them for being backing away, as it were, in some ways from uh, globalization, uh, even though, like I said, George H. W. Bush talked about the New World Order. Tell me a little bit about that critique that you have, because it seems to go beyond just simply um, economics. Well, I think, I think George Bush one actually was in somewhat an early globalist. I think um, George Bush too, I'll say, Really, um, in his international policy, in his geopolitical policy, um, he did everything to, in a way, prevent the world from coming to what his father talked about, to this new world order. He, it, was like a, it, was like a, it was a total reaction against what his father was talking about. Um, he made it much more, you know, difficult for Russia, who was not as aggressive at that time, to be a member of, of to be a player. He, they did all, they withdrew from the, they not withdrew, they, they killed the Kyoto Treaty, the first really major, major action for global warming. So at, on at, action after action, they withdrew from what um, George Bush withdrew from actually what his father started to put in place. So is this a, where does this conservatism come from, I guess, a neoconservatism? Because I mean, because particularly when I looked at some of this, uh, one of the things that struck me is that uh, this particularly breaking some of the uh, 
the arms uh, agreements, um, that that seemed to be, and, and, and the intervention obviously in Iraq and Afghanistan, those seem to be um, as if this was a, a giant that is the United States being held back by these Lilliputians, these small countries that we couldn't do anything, that, that we seem to be strapped down. Um, Vietnam probably was the, the last big one in terms of, of a war. But it does seem as if there is this frustration uh, that here we are, this major power, and yet we have such limits in terms of what we can do. Well, I think, one, I think it's, it's, it's truly, the world changed by the time that George Bush II became president, but his advisor's mindset was still very much into the idea that America is the empire. And to a certain extent, the world changed. We, we, had, we had nurtured countries. We did something no one else in the world ever did um, in the early Cold War under Truman and Eisenhower, um, and actually under Johnson and through Nixon. We, we let our enemies become wealthy and become our partners. So whether that's Germany, whether that's Japan, and even um, look at what Kissinger and, um, did with um, China, and then the support of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, so we let our enemies become wealthy. Um, there were people that, you know, whose mindset didn't understand that, didn't understand that once these countries become wealthy, they want to be partners with us in the management of the global society. And that's, that's totally logical. I want to turn to uh, immigration, because that's one of the key issues, certainly, that, that Trump has um, uh, hailed in terms of his own particular political uh, movement. Tell me a little bit about the benefit that you see in terms of immigration in the United States, but also the reaction in other countries as well uh, that uh, there's some resistance to it and that they could very well um, fall from, yeah, go ahead. In, in we, one, we have to say that we are a country, as we know, immigrants. I mean, every everyone in this country except for the Native Americans, who were, of course, here first, and the African Americans who were brought, brought here as slaves, voluntarily, more or less, chose to come here as immigrants to start a new to start a new life. We are a country of immigrants. To deny that is to deny our DNA, who we are. Being an immigrant country has really made us made a, gave given us a dynamic that other countries didn't have because we have this whole mixture of cultures in that the that intellectually and culturally challenge each other and gives us a new way to look at the world. Other countries don't have that. So it's really been beneficial to our culture. Saying that, though, on the other hand, you can't have, of course, open borders. You can't let everybody in. Else there'll be no culture. It will be totally destroyed. So there needs some regulation. Um, Trump, of course, is using it as an issue, um, basically as a, a populist, not even a populist, the pure racist issue uh, to stop immigrants. And, and that's really, I think, harmful to our economy. One of the other and one of the direct things about immigration here in the United States is how young our population is. These are all the other major industrial countries. We have one of the youngest populations because of immigration. Because of that, that's a direct future stimulus to our economy, having such a young population. Because you mentioned, for instance, uh, Angela Merkel at, in Germany sort of taking the right approach, even though it's politically risky, uh, to encourage immigration, as we saw in Europe, as opposed to, say, Viktor Orban in, in, in Hungary. Right. Well, Germany has the problem of it's an aging society. For whatever reason, Europe has basically gone out of the baby-making business. Um, not my expertise, for sure, why right. that has happened. Uh, so they need immigrants desperately to work in the factories. Once again, to have young people paying Social Security tax so that it supports the retirees. For the German economy to continue to flourish, it needs immigration. And that's why Merkel, 
Merkel did an, an amazing thing. And in my mind, she's a great leader. But she led in a million immigrants, and, you know, she got a lot of political flack for it. She did it both for humanitarian reasons and really basic um, economic reasons for Germany's future. It was a brilliant move. But yet, of course, she got a, had a lot of political heat from it. But sometimes leaders need to make those types of decisions. It reminds me of, of Japan, which was this rising economic power, certainly uh, is, is coming into the 70s and the 80s, and its population itself has this aging problem. Oh, Japan is the oldest, po oldest population of any major industrial country, and it's a huge problem. Added to that, of course, is the lack of women in this workforce, so it has a double whammy. So in terms of immigration, um, obviously we absorb uh, various cultures. Uh, we know that, for instance, uh, the white population is going to probably be below 50 percent within the next uh, few decades. What does that mean in terms of people who look at uh, the country, the way they grew up in it, uh, and they say, gee, it's changing. I don't, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable. What, what happens to them? Or do they just simply die off? I mean, what's you know, it, it, it is difficult, but it, it's, it's a reality, you know. What, what, what's, what's, you know, change, once again, change, it, it's like globalization being, on part, um, being part of evolution. Change is part of that, and one has to get you, I mean, that's being a human being, getting used to change. I mean, it, I'm going to give an out-of-the-way analogy here, but think about Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York, used to be the camera capital of the world, uh, making Kodak Brownie cameras. No one has a Kodak Brownie camera anymore. Why? Because it's the cameras in your iPhone. Um, that's change. It happens. That you know, it had nothing to do with globalization. That's change. But what about the the change in the culture, bringing different people in? We certainly saw that. In the 1920s, obviously, when and they have slapped a immigration uh, reform act back then. Um, but it, it, they, I think, part of the problem too is not just simply economic, but a cultural thing that they see. I mean, I know people, for instance, who walk around and even on the Eastern Shore, Maryland, very conservative. They see signs of Spanish, and they seem as if they feel as if they're alienated from the place that they live. I mean, how does one deal with that? I mean. Or is there a way to you know, deal with it? You know, it is it, it, it is tough. And, and once again, in, in the U.S. history, we've always gone through these periods of more immigration than closing immigration a bit, than having more immigration than when there's been too much of a political reaction, closing it a bit. This is not a new phenomenon in U.S. history. Um, but we see that... Um, you know, it's like the old World War II movies where the, the soldiers, they would give the names of the people, you know, the, who were fighting in these movies. And it would always be someone with an Italian name from the Bronx in New York and someone with an Irish name from um, Boston. I mean, they blend in these, eventually in a generation or two, these new immigrants blend into American culture. By the way, I return to the 2016 election because you... It seemed, I believe you write that um, it was really a victory for the rural areas as opposed to the cities. What did you mean by that? Well, I think it was, uh, well, first it's how the electoral college was set up. But um, basically, it, it, not so much rural as victory for the areas that lost industry, um, partly because of globalization, and more because of, on my mind, because of automation. Um, th that frustration burst open in the 2016 election, um, the, where the where the urban the urban areas, whether it's New York, San Francisco, D.C., Baltimore, where you, you're near, uh, Chicago, these areas boomed from globalization, and they became magnets, actually attracting um, the best and the brightest from the rural areas um, to the cities and really left a lot of the, the, the rural areas kind of desolate. 
And so this is the, uh, the, the given that the, the fact that we are operating with this sort of 18th century document, the Constitution, which, as you indicate, gives land in many ways more representation than than people. Um, is there is that going to continue? Do you think? I mean, uh, do you think that the, the those spaces are going to continue to dominate American politics, or do you think the populations, in terms of the, the cities, is going to catch up? Well, well, the system is fixed at the moment um, in favor of them, as, as you just mentioned. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, I, I always think of the, um, the 1787 Constitution is a wonderful document, but, you know, what modern American um, corporation would have its operating system written for um, a 1787 world? So we're in the same place. So that's that's a huge problem. Uh, but uh, you know, and I don't know. Obviously, I don't know how COVID will change this. You know, I don't know if if rural areas in working at home will take power away from the cities. I have no idea. Hmm, interesting. You mentioned, by the way, you have, uh, I guess, three uh, items of, of some kind of political solutions to uh, the United States uh, primary system, Citizens United, gerrymandering. Tell me a little bit about those solutions. Well, not so much solutions. I, I mean, I think the primary system is a a major problem. You know, it was developed by Fallon and other people as a reform, especially, I think, in, in also in California as a reform. And it's turned out to be not a reform, but it, it's turned out to give minority excess power. I mean, our Constitution gives the minority voice, which is really an excellent thing. Few other documents do that, few other political documents. But the primary system gives the minority a veto power. And so if we look at... Um, Many Republican Congress people, many Republican senators, they have this constant threat over their head that unless they um, really stay on the true um, party line, the true extremely conservative party line, they will be primary. This is a problem because it, it, it closes out other voices. You don't have a more fluid Republican Party because of the threat of primary. And I take a Terry Bandering that fits into that. And how does uh, Citizens United in terms of money? I don't Excuse me, I didn't hear you. So how does uh, the, the Citizens United in terms of the kind of money we're seeing poured into these things? Well, that's a huge other problem. I mean, it, 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 uh, Citizens United seems to me uh, takes away the idea of one person, one vote. Because if I have, if I'm extremely, extremely wealthy and can give a major, major donation or a corporation a major, major donation to a political party or a candidate, I have more of a more power than the person who just can vote. Finally, just briefly, are you optimistic that um, the country will be able to adapt, or are you pessimistic? I change day by day. <laughs> you do. <laughs> Honestly, I change day by day. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, Edward Goldberg. He teaches uh, at the New York University's Center for Global Affairs, and he's written a new book called Why Globalization Works for America, and we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us uh, this morning. Thank you so much, and great question. Thank you. This has been Del Marva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.